Don't Split the Small Stuff, Part 5. Chapter 10. Learn to live in the present moment. To a large degree, the measure of our peace of mind is determined by how much we are able to live in the present moment. Irrespect irrespective of what happened yesterday or last year and what may or may not happen tomorrow, the present moment is where you are always. Without a question, many of us have mastered the neurotic art of spending much of our lives worrying about a variety of things all at once. We allow past problems and future concerns to dominate our present moment, so much so that we end up anxious, frustrated, depressed, and hopeless. On the flip side, we also postpone our gratification, our stated priorities, and our happiness, often convincing ourselves that someday will be better than others. Unfortunately, the same mental dynamics that tell us to look toward the future will only repeat themselves so that someday never actually arrives. John Lennon once said, Life is what's happening while, you're, while we're busy making other plans. When we're busy making other plans. Our children are busy growing up. People we love move away, always move away and dying. Our bodies are getting out of shape, and our dreams are slipping away. In short, we miss out on life. Many people live as if life were a dress rehearsal for some later date. It isn't in fact. No one has a guarantee to be that bleh, that he or she will be that be here tomorrow. Now is the only time we have, and the only time that we have any control over. When our attention is on the present moment, we push fear from our minds. Fear is the concern over events that might happen in the future. We won't have enough money. Our children will get into trouble. We will get old and die. Whatever. To combat fear, the best strategy is to learn to bring your attention back to the present. Mark Twain said, I have been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. I don't think I can say it any better. Practice keeping your attention on here and now. Your efforts will pay great dividends. Chapter 13, or chapter 11. Imagine that everyone is enlightened except you. This strategy gives you a chance to practice something that is probably completely unacceptable to you. However, if you give it a try, you might find that it's one of the most helpful exercises in self-improvement. As the title suggests, the idea is to imagine that everyone you know and everyone you meet is perfectly enlightened. That is, everyone except you. The people you meet are all here to teach you something. Perhaps the obnoxious driver or disrespectful teenager is here to teach you about patience. The punk rocker might be here to teach you to be Less judgmental. Your job is to try to determine what the people in your life are trying to teach you. You'll find that if you do this, you'll be far less annoyed, bothered, and frustrated by the actions and imperfections of other people. You can actually get yourself in the habit of approaching life in this manner, and if you do, you'll be glad you did. Often, once you discover what someone is trying to teach you, it's easy to let go of your frustrations. For example, suppose you're in the post office 
and the postal clerk appears to be intentionally moving slowly. Rather than feeling frustrated, ask yourself the question, what is he trying to teach me? Maybe you need to learn about compassion. How hard it would be to have a job that you don't like. Or perhaps you could learn a little more about being patient. Standing in line is an excellent opportunity to break your habit of feeling impatient. You may be surprised at how fun and easy this is. All you're really doing is changing your perception from why are they doing this to what are they trying to teach me. Take a look around today at all the enlightened people. Chapter 12. Let others be right most of the time. One of the most important questions you can ever ask yourself is, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? Many times, the two are mutually exclusive. Being right, defending our position, takes an enormous amount of mental energy and often alienates us from the people in our lives. Needing to be right or needing someone else to be wrong encourages others to become defensive and puts pressure on us to keep defending. Yet many of us, me too at times, spend a great deal of time and energy attempting to prove or point out that we are right and or others are wrong. Many people consciously or unconsciously believe that it's somehow their job to show others their positions, statements, and points of view are incorrect, and that in doing so, the person they are correcting is going to somehow appreciate it, or at least learn something wrong. Think about it. Have you ever been corrected by someone and said to the person who is trying to be right? Thank you so much. For showing me that I'm wrong and you're right. Now, I see it. Boy, you're great. Or has anyone you know ever thanked you or even agreed with you when you're correcting that? When you corrected them or made yourself right at their expense? Of course not. The truth is, all of us hate to be corrected. We all want our positions to be respected and understood by others. Being listened to and heard is one of the greatest desires of the human heart. And those who learn to listen are the most loved and respected. Those who are in the habit of correcting others are often resented and avoided. It's not that it's never appropriate to be right. Sometimes you genuinely need to be or want to be. Perhaps there are certain philosophical positions that you don't want to budge on, such as when you hear a racist comment. Here, it's important to speak your mind. Usually, however, it's just your ego creeping in and running an otherwise peaceful encounter, a habit of wanting or needing to be right. A wonderful, heartfelt strategy for becoming more peaceful and loving is to pra practice allowing others the joy of being right. Give them the glory. Stop correcting. As hard as it may be to change this habit, it's worth any effort and practice it takes. When someone says, I really feel it's important to, rather than jumping in and saying, no, it's more important to, or any of the hundreds of other forms 
of conversational editing. Simply let it go and allow their statements to stand. The people in your life will become less defensive and more loving. They will appreciate you more than you could ever have dreamed possible. Even if they don't exactly know why, you'll discover the joy of participating in and witnessing other people's happiness, which is far more rewarding than the battle of ages. You don't have to sacrifice your deepest philosophical truths or most heartfelt opinions, but starting today, let others be right most of the time. Chapter 13, Becoming More Patient. The quality of patience goes a long way towards your goal of creating a more peaceful and loving self. The more patient you are, the more accepting you will be of what is, rather than insisting that life is exactly as you would like it to be. Without patience, life is extremely frustrating. You are easily annoyed, bothered, and irritated. Patience adds a dimension of ease and acceptance to your life. It's essential for inner peace. Becoming more patient involves opening your heart to the present moment, even if you don't like it. If you are stuck in a traffic jam, late for an appointment, opening to the moment would mean catching yourself, building a mental snowball before your thinking got out of hand and gently reminding yourself to relax. It might also be a good time to breathe, as well as an opportunity to remind yourself that in the larger scheme of things, being late is small stuff. Patience also involves seeing the innocence in others. My wife, Chris, and I have two young children, ages four and seven. On many occasions, while writing this book, our four-year-old daughter has walked into my office and interrupted my work, which can be disruptive to a writer. What I have learned to do, most of the time, is to see the innocence in her behavior, rather than to focus on the potential implications of her interruption. I won't get my work done. I'll lose my train of thought. This was my only opportunity to write today, and so forth. I remind myself why she is coming to see me, because she loves me, not because she is conspiring to ruin my work. When I remember to see the innocence, I immediately bring forth a feeling of patience, and my attention is brought back to the moment. Any irritation that may have been building is eliminated, and I am reminded once again of how fortunate I am to have such beautiful children. I have found that if you look deeply enough, you can almost always see the innocence in other people, as well as in potentially frustrating situations. When you do, you will become a more patient and peaceful person, and in some strange way, you begin to enjoy many of the moments that used to frustrate you.